Welcome to tonight's talk, the third and final in our series on Iran, Struggle of a Nation. The first two speakers in the series were Roger Cohen and Abbas Malani. The speaker series was organized primarily through Caltech's Social Activism Speaker Series, or SAS, which is a group of students interested in raising awareness through grassroots efforts and bringing to Caltech's campus a variety of speakers with a diversity of activism backgrounds. SAS is planning a few more events this spring, and you should um, continue to pay attention to both to SAS's website to see what those will be, those upcoming events. Also, uh, the GSC will be planning a variety of events that you might be interested in, and the contact information for these groups is on the boards behind. Um, an additional three groups have offered significant support for the entire series on Iran, and we'd like to acknowledge them as well. They are the Caltech Y, the Graduate Student Council, and the Moore Hufstedler Fund, which provided the primary financial support for tonight's event, as well as the other two. Now, now I'd like to introduce Ronnie Bryan, a fourth year graduate student in computational and neural systems and active member of SAS, to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the third and final event of the Iran, uh, the series on Iran, Struggle of a Nation. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Kareem Sajjadpour, who is uh, an excellent choice for the, for the final speaker because of his extensive experience studying uh, not only Iran, but many uh, other uh, parts of the world. He brings uh, that experience to his uh, frequent uh, uh, blog post updates on uh, CarnegieEndowment.org, where you can read about a lot of the latest uh, analysis that he's been doing and that he delivers to the State Department and to the Senate and to, and to the Congress to help guide uh, United States foreign policy in the region. Um, he uh, has been studying Iran, working on this uh, on this uh, issues in this region for over 10 years. First in the International Crisis Group, uh, where he did uh, on the ground work in Tehran, and now with the uh, Carnegie Endowment for Peace, um, where he's the uh, uh, one of the main analysts uh, for Iran, and he also works on nuclear uh, non-proliferation issues. Uh, is everything okay with the lights for everybody? <laughs> Everyone can see? All right, great. Uh, uh, Kareem's background is in uh, political science and film, which gives him an interesting analytical perspective on a lot of the, uh, the, the drama, I guess you could say, that happens in, on the international stage. Um, uh, on the car ride over here, he did mention to me that uh, he, he met uh, Tom Brady at uh, at a University of Michigan when he was a soccer player there. I thought that was interesting. He also met the uh, writer of the uh, American Pie movies, which is an interesting little bit of uh, trivia. Um, Kareem is a kindred spirit with uh, those of us who are graduate students here because he is also working on a PhD relating to his, uh, his work on Iran now, so we can definitely appreciate the, the sort of analytical rigor and academic perspective that he's bringing and so hopefully uh, you all enjoy hearing from him today. Thank, uh, please uh, help me in welcoming Mr. Sajjadpour. Thank you all very much for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, what I'm going to focus on today is uh, the topic behind me, uh, how Iran could change and how a change Iran could possibly change the world. And there's an anecdote I always love to share um, with people. It's my favorite uh, uh, anecdote from my time based in Tehran. Uh, a friend of mine once, who, who lives in Iran uh, once told me that life in Iran is either tragedy or it's comedy, but there's not much in between. It's, it's tremendously tra tragic, the uh, stifled human potential you see in Iran, especially this um, vibrant young population, but it can be common the way that Iranians handle it with their characteristic wit and humor. So several years ago when I was based in Tehran, I was traveling to visit a friend of mine in central Tehran. And I always tell people that if you base your analysis of Iranian politics on what Tehran taxi drivers tell you, you could have predicted a revolution a long time ago. Because Tehran taxi drivers have very difficult jobs. They're constantly stuck in traffic and just in pollution, and very angry with the government. And so this driver was um, uh, very animated, uh, um, 
Uh, that day happened to be um, the object of his ire was the former president, Hashim al And I uh, casually looked up at the street sign. Thank you. And I happened to notice we were on a street called Khalid Islam Bouli Street. And some of you may, may remember who Khalid Islam Bouli was. He was the guy who killed Anwar Sadat, the former president of Egypt. And uh, the Iranian government named the street after Khalid Islam Bouli because Anwar Sadat was a very good friend of the Shah of Iran. And uh, any enemy of the Shah of Iran is a friend of the Islamic Republic. So they named the street after Khalid Islam Bouli. And to this day, this is a reason why there are no official relations between Egypt and Iran. And I was curious to get this guy's reaction. So I said, do you know who Khalid Islam Bouli was? He said, I have no idea. I said, it's the guy who killed Anwar Sadat. And uh, he was outraged by this. He said, Egypt is a great nation. We need to have relations with Egypt. What kind of a government do we, do we have in the streets after assassins? And unintentionally, I got him very um, worked up and animated. And I was worried about his capacity to drive at that point. <laughs> I said, uh, take the next, next right turn, please. It doesn't matter which right, just take the next right turn. And uh, we took the next right turn, and he looked up at that street, and it was uh, uh, Bucharest Street, the capital of Romania. And he looked at me very angrily, and he said, who did that bastard Bucharest? <laughs> <laughs> and and, and uh, again, when I, when I think about this um, stifled uh, uh, human potential in Rome, um, and you think about this uh, younger generation and the tremendous uh, courage and resilience they've shown uh, throughout the last eight months especially, uh, I do have hope uh, for, for change in Iran. So that's what I want to focus on uh, very briefly. But I'll also talk about the challenges uh, facing um, this nascent uh, democratic movement. Uh, and then I'd like to focus the rest of my talk on US policy towards Iran, because that's how I'm spending a lot of my days and kind of interacting with people from the Obama administration. Now, I think uh, when, I, when I say I'm hopeful about Iran's future, um, um, I think the, the primary reason why is demographics. Uh, you look at this country in 1979 when the revolution happened, Ayatollah Khomeini encouraged people to have a lot of children to produce this robust Islamic society. In 1979, the population was 35 million. Today, it's about 75 million. So 40 million Iranians were born after the revolution. Uh, they have no inherent uh, enmity towards the ancien regime. They have no inherent uh, loyalty to the Islamic Republic. And 2010 was a much different world than 1979. We're in the age of satellite television, in the age of the internet. And it's much more difficult to keep your population uh, in the dark. Um, so this was you know, what I frequently noticed um, traveling uh, throughout Iran and interacting with so many uh, young Iranians is that um, they obviously aspire to have the same types of uh, political freedoms and social freedoms and as their counterparts elsewhere in the world. But primarily, I think, um, when you would engage people about their lives, what was really lacking was economic dignity, um, uh, economic prospects for, for the younger generation, and, and um, an economic dignity for the older generation, uh, which is struggling under the weight of tremendous inflation uh, and unemployment, underemployment. And <clears throat> when I look now at Iranian society, it's quite remarkable that, uh, you know, when the protests uh, first began last summer, uh, June of 2009, I think there were a lot of skeptics who said, well, these are only the uh, uh, urban elite, uh, youth of northern Tehran, kind of the more uh, middle and upper class youth, and it doesn't really transcend uh, the socioeconomic divides or geographic divides. And when you look now at Iranian society and you look at kind of the societal elites, it's difficult for me to find any uh, major group among societal elites uh, that is not under the umbrella of the green movement, the opposition movement, one way or the other. Uh, you look at the clerics, this is you know, what it is. It's called a clerical state. But if you look at uh, the most senior grand ayatollahs in Iran, um, of the 10 most senior grand ayatollahs in Iran, I believe only two have come out and um, expressly endorsed the election results. 
the most senior among them have refrained from doing so. And you recall uh, Grand Ayatollah Montezedi, who was uh, Iran's most senior cleric, was also Iran's most prominent dissident. And at his funeral last December during the month of Ashura, 500,000 people demonstrated in the city of Qom, um, which is really the Shiite heartland of Iran, Iran's uh, uh, red state galore, very far away from, from the urban elite in northern Tehran. Um, then you look at uh, the other kind of societal elites, uh, artists, uh, actors, actresses, uh, filmmakers, musicians. I can name for you uh, so many of these that are, have expressly put themselves under the umbrella uh, of the Green Movement. There's a very famous uh, musician, I'm sure that some of you know, uh, Mr. Shah Jalyan, who uh, told state television they no longer had permission to use his music in state television broadcasts. Uh, some of the country's most famous filmmakers, like Mohsen Mahmoud, who become almost spokespeople uh, for the cause of the opposition. And uh, uh, very importantly for such a young society, which is so crazy about football, or as we say, to soccer, uh, the Iranian soccer team, and the most uh, kind of, uh, prominent uh, athletes have come under the umbrella of the Green Movement. So when I look at this society, it seems to me um, all of the various societal elites, ranging from their religious elites to artistic elites to many of the political elites, uh, have found themselves under the umbrella of this Green Movement. Now, as I said earlier, I think that there was a lot of skepticism um, from people who said, well, Iran is a religious society. It's a traditional society, and therefore, people like the idea of having an Islamic state, an Islamic republic. And I recalled um, another anecdote uh, from my time based in Tehran several years back. Uh, I was traveling to go meet an advisor to President Khatami, then President Khatami. Uh, a guy called Mustafa <coughs> Tajzadeh, who happens to be in prison right now. And I remember um, I was again engaging um, this taxi driver uh, about politics, and uh, in the first half hour he was um, um, quite outspoken and condemning the government and, um, and complaining that the Mullahs are crooks, etc. And um, the last 20 minutes I, I asked him if we could just have some quiet time so I could prepare for my interview. And I said, sure, no problem, it's okay. And um, about five minutes before he was about to drop me off, out of the blue, he asked me a question. He said, uh, Mr. Karim, do you like kharbozeh? Uh, some of you know what kharbozeh is. It's a type of melon in Rome. He said, do you like melon? I said, sure, I like uh, melon. And he said, how about asal, honey? Do you like honey? I said, yeah, I like honey too. He said, you know, you should never eat these two together because it will uh, uh, create a stone in your stomach. So avoid eating these two together. I said, okay. I promise I won't eat melon and honey together. And I thought, you know, it's quite odd. Uh, for the first half hour, he's cursing the government, and then he tells me not to eat melon and honey together. And um, before he was dropping me off, he said, you know, Mr. Karim, uh, politics is melon, and religion is honey. Uh, these two together, uh, I'm sorry, these two separately, they're very good. Both politics is good and religion is good. But when you mix the two together, you taint both the name of politics and the name of religion. And this is coming from a taxi driver with a sixth grade uh, education, who uh, has kind of, uh, this is a, an intellectual evolution, evolution from the grassroots. I can tell you as someone who travels throughout the Arab world, a taxi driver in Damascus or Cairo or Riyadh would never be able to make this distinction for you. In fact, on the contrary, these are places which are romanticizing about the prospect now of joining religion and politics together. Uh, but in Iran, having endured this experience, uh, I think you have many people, in particular from traditional classes who are devoutly religious, who believe that it's a mistake to uh, keep these two together and there needs to be more of a separation. Um, but, but I think one of the reasons why I'm most hopeful about um, the prospect of political reform in Iran is the sheer ineptitude and uh, inability